Hallelujah. Shalom, everybody. Welcome to Prophecy Ministries. I know people are still coming in. We're getting a little bit late start, but it's our it's our new members Bible study. And uh, I'm glad that you are all here. On the table, there is a mic. You guys remember how to hold the mic. Don't cup it. Don't cover the transmitter. And speak nice and clear into the microphone so everybody online can hear you. We're going to have somebody open us up with a prayer. And then we're going to dive in. Because we have a lot of questions from yesterday's Bible study that we need to cover. All right. Who would like to pray for us? I got it. Yeah. Abba, thank you for this day. Thank you for another chance to breathe soak up your word we don't want to take these for granted these days and this time together thank you for the fellowship that you're building thank you for this place that we can come to that's called by your name um, we ask that your word would um, be on good soil today and reach those that it needs to reach and pierce the hearts we thank you for all that you do for us thank you for the children here thank you for the parents and the leadership. All these things we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Let's get it in. Let's start with the internet's questions from yesterday. And if you're watching us live on the internet, please go ahead and post your questions in the chat. We have a couple people monitoring the chat and we'll be able to get to your questions. All right. What do we got? Ooh, who's that? Is that you? You got a mic all the way over there? Ah, that was probably you. Is it on? Yeah. Okay. All right. Here we go. All right. So we're going to pick up where we left off on um, somebody was asking about Hebrews 6, 1. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. What are they asking about it? They did not respond to me when I was asking what specifically they were asking. But usually when they put the scripture, they want... Barakatha. Got it. This one uh, is a very interesting scripture. Uh, so I've covered it a few times. So I may know what the person is asking about. Uh, Mo, turn off your mic for us. Because you're the furthest away from the transmitter. So you're probably creating that interference. What you doing over there in the corner, though? You're not in trouble. Don't be in the corner. <laughs> He, he, he don't want the cameras to pick him up. They might, they might be looking for more Dean right there. He's like, is, is them dark glasses and a trench coat you wearing today? <laughs> Man. All right. Hebrews chapter six, verse one. Go ahead. Therefore, leaving the principles of doctrine of Christ. Pause right there. That line sounds crazy. And this is what most people are uh, struggling with it says you're leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ what are the principles of the doctrine of Christ the, the commandments see you're not supposed to be stuck on the milk your whole life you have to graduate to some meat you can't always be struggling with keeping the commandments you got to learn faith you have to mature so now that we understand, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, what should we go on to? Keep, keep reading. Let us go on into perfection. Ah, okay. What is perfection? Your faith needs to be perfected. Your heart needs to be willing. Hold that verse right there. And let's go to 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 61 to look at a precept. And then we're going to come right back. First Kings chapter eight, verse 61. First Kings chapter eight, verse 61. Let your heart therefore be perfect with Yahweh, our Yah, to walk in, stat in his statutes and to keep his commandments as at this day. Okay, so what is it that's going to make your heart perfect? What you need to do? Keep you need to keep the commandments. Um, Gary, what mic number are you on? Bring down two in the house for us. Gary always loud. His voice sound like Russian waters. <laughs> okay, watch this. Let your heart be perfect with Yahweh. Allah And then it tells you how to do that. 
to walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments. When? You going to start next week? It says at this day. Okay, but perfection is not just you doing it because there's some people doing it only because they don't want to be punished. Perfection is you doing it in faith because you believe that his way is the right way and you love him. So I want you to imagine that you are a parent and you have, <clears throat> you have a child and you say, I want you to do this thing. I want you to take out the trash and they just do it. They do it because they love you. Imagine that, right? That's why I said, imagine it. Cause it don't really happen. No, no watch this. <laughs> they just do it because they love you and they're obedient. Okay. But then you have that same child and you say, I want you to take out the trash and they say they're going to do it but then they don't do it. So you have to add something to it. If you don't take out that trash, I'm gonna get the switch. Okay, why are they taking out the trash now? Because they don't wanna get punished. Is that the same thing as doing it because they love you? No, so doing it because you, keeping the commandments because you love the most high is completely different than keeping the commandments because you don't wanna be punished. One of them is perfection. Your heart is perfected when you completely trust in him and rely on him, knowing that his way is the right way. Okay, now watch. Now let's go back to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, because it's telling you you have to progress to perfection. Read Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 from the top, please. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ... Let us go on unto perfection, mm -hmm. not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward Yah. Not laying again the foundation of repentance. Do I need to keep repenting and repenting and repenting? No, at some point I should be able to stop repenting for the sins that I've committed because I outgrow those things. Right? Probably that, that, that perfection has to do with also with maturity. In, in that's exactly what we're talking about you have to mature in christ have you ever talked to somebody who they use this excuse no matter how long you know them i'm just a babe in christ you've been walking for 50 years how is it that you still just a babe in christ sinner saved by grace, sinner saved by grace. very similar you you have to leave the the principles i don't need to keep telling you to to keep the 10 commandments and to just put your faith in him you need to move on to some meat Okay, watch verse two. Of the doctrine of baptisms mm -hmm. and of laying on of hands mm -hmm. and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Okay, watch. Take a look at how this sentence is structured. At the end of verse one, there is not a period. There's a comma, meaning that all of these things are what we're moving on to, not the laying on, I'm sorry, not the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward Yah, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Am I still supposed to, I'm supposed to grow past those things. Those are some very heavy things, aren't they? Right? Verse three says, and this we will do. What will we do? We will leave the principles and we will mature in our faith beyond these carnal things beyond us having to continually be reminded to repent and we will do that if Yah permits us that's the understanding of that scripture what you got Moadine? go ahead If he permits, mm -hmm. the power permits. So that reminds me that you know from the, found, from the foundation uh, of the of the world, uh, his people were <coughs> chosen. You know before we got here and everything. So it's all about. Your mic is going to create that static because you're like 50 feet away. Yeah. We, we got it. Yeah. Talk. Yep. We still got to hear you in the mic. You got to hold the mic. Hold it from here or else the people are not going to hear you. It's going to be silent for a bunch of minutes. Hold it just like that. Pull it right up. There you go. Right here. Okay. Perfect. Oh, man. You sound like you about to spit bars now. <laughs> go ahead and spit some bars. Okay. What I was saying is. 
it kind of reminds me of the wheat and the tear and all of this, you mm-hmm. know what I mean, to the point where if he permits. And so we see that behavior where people aren't actually um, uh, maturing in the document of word. You know, uh, should we just be concerned about that, uh, particularly if they they express it that they want it, or should we just leave it alone? I don't know. Um, so it really has to do with um, the understanding. So people will come and learn, but if they don't apply it, if they don't understand it, if they don't depart from evil, from learning the commandments and all that, then it's, um, yeah, it has to be applied. Yeah, if you're learning this stuff, but you're not applying it, it's a waste of time. It's like watching all the kung fu movies in the world and thinking you know kung fu. You're going to go out there in the streets and get beat. You ain't thrown a single punch, but you know every Bruce Lee movie, right? That's, I know a gang of scriptures, but I have no idea how to apply them. That's what it's like. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, Katrina just texted and said she can't hear anything on the mics. You ain't got anything on that end, Greg? Are we good? No, everybody's saying they're good. Okay. Test the audio. They're saying that they can't hear. They can't hear anything? Oh, really? Roll it up. Roll yours up. We can hear loud and clear here. <laughs> yeah, it's loud and clear. I don't know what's going on. Yeah, turn their devices up. Turn your devices up, folks. All right, look. look. Okay, hallelujah. We, we appreciate that feedback. You said you have a precept, Aki? Yes, sir. I got uh, James 1, 4. James chapter 1. Hold that Hebrews if you're using a paper Bible because we're, we, we're going to come back to that. James chapter 1, verse 4 is our precept. It says, but let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So we have mm. an option to, um, to finish whatever the lesson is or and then be perfect and complete or we can opt out and never learn the lesson and keep going around in this circle until until we get it um it's a choice it's a choice to want to choose to continue in the the lesson or uh throw a fit opt out and then never learn the lesson Mm. that's amen that's strong i uh, just want to say like uh you know when you want to do it the hard way and you you say you strong hearted uh, headed and you know stiff neck and you want to learn the hard way then because that's the best way you learn but that's going to cause a lot of baggage it's going to cause a lot of uh having to you know relearn certain things have to start all over again and you lose progression when you try to do it the hard way it's better to watch example and, and, and learn it from that way so you ain't got to experience mm-hmm. what the other person had to go through to show you that example. Mm-hmm. That's right. So, yeah. Amen. And, and, and another thing is, too, is that so I can say <clears throat> I can say I want to grow. I can say that I want more of y'all. I can say that I, my lips can say a whole bunch of things. Mm-hmm. But then my actions, my heart, what's going on inside can be far from that. You know what I mean? Yeah. I put the show on. And, and but then the inward man is saying a whole completely different thing. Amen. A very good point. Now, with that being said, is that something that a person would, because um, you, like you said, it's the inward man. So, you know, because obviously we can't see the show. Like all we see is the show. So if they're putting on something on the outside, all we see is what they're putting on the outside. But like uh, G2 said, the inward man has to make these these progressions is that just a, is that a situation to where you just have to look within yourself in order to figure out what you need and how to progress yourself in the scriptures so you're off of the milk and start to get into the meat every person has to examine where they are in their walk like uh and if you're only doing this for the appearance so that somebody so that you look holy it's not going to work out very well But if you really examine and say, I'm struggling with this, and then the scripture says, confess your faults one to another, right? And pray for one another. If somebody really does that, like if I confess my faults to you and you say, yeah, and you could probably work on this too, then that's going to be building me up. 
right? But it starts with me examining myself. Amen? Amen. All right. I just increased the microphones in the stream for everybody that is uh, online. Somebody let me know if you can hear all of the other microphones better. I know Gary and me sound loud and clean. Can like you all hear me? Whoa. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't adjust that. She just, she just loud. Started screaming in the it's, mic. It's just because she, she got kids. That's why she, she, you heard, she said, can y'all hear me? And I almost ran from the, I mean, I almost ran. It was crazy. So, so we got oh, one yes. You got a yes. Okay. We got microphone number one. All right. Everybody's okay. good. Okay. Good, good. Good. Well, hey, real quick, going back to the, to, to the, to James 1, 4, it's, but I'm going to read it one more time, but it says, but let patience have her perfect work. That means that I, that I can interfere with that, with that process of letting patience have her perfect work. I can get in the way. Like I said, if I choose to opt out, if I choose to not be honest, if I choose not to look intently into the mirror, which is the scriptures, and examine myself, I can opt out from letting patience have her work within me by saying, you know what, nah, man, I don't want to do this, or, you know, oh, that's not me, or what about you? You know what I'm saying? When, when the time does come, when it's time for me to look intently into the mirror, and I'm like, nah, that ain't, or if I want to sit there and lie about it, then I can I can opt out from letting patience uh, have her perfect work, so that mm -hmm. I may be complete, mature, um, and perfect and entire, complete, and not wanting anything. Yeah. Now, with with that being said, what is so? What's the first step when you do struggle with those things? Because like for me, it's the vape, right? Like so, I tell myself I'm throwing it down, I'm putting it down, this, that, and third, but I don't. Like you know what I mean? And I don't. And you know, I'll, I'll tell myself, Gary. There's two, two parts. These two parts have to go together. Consistency and patience. And you can't have one without the other. How are you going to do the right thing sometimes? Or how are you going to have inconsistent patience? That doesn't make any sense. So the first thing that you have to do is know, this is what I'm going to do. And then every moment, do that thing until it becomes consistent. And even if you slip up in that thing, have patience with yourself and say, I messed up in the last five minutes, but for the next 10 minutes, next hour, I'm going to get it right. So this is a every moment of the day process. And then that verse on the screen that we have there, but let patience have her perfect work. Let me give you an example of what that's like. So uh, Greg fixed my watch. Okay. Uh, and it's interesting that we're talking about a watch because I want you to imagine that you have a watch that you really like and you give it to somebody to fix it. And then you, f you call them every five minutes talking about, is it ready yet? Is it ready yet? Is it ready yet? Man, it's been, you don't know how long it's been. They got your watch. You just feel like it's been a long time. And here's when you fail. You go pick up the broken watch and put it back on so that you can wear it around. Cause you like that watch so much, but it don't work. Does that make sense? So patience has to have her perfect work. That means you are focused on the end, the outcome. A lot of us, we, we're raised to be um, uh, desiring instant gratification. The microwave, generation. microwave generation. That's what it is. Whatever the problem is, I want to put it in the microwave, press, press uh, three minutes or a pre-program and pop it out and grub. That's not going to happen when it comes to you actually making changes in your life. You're going to have to be able to go through it. And the scripture tells you, you are going to fall. It doesn't say you might fall. It says you're going to fall. But we have to get back up again. Amen. Amen. So real quick. So G2 said something Hold about it up. being in the mirror. That's uh, James 1.23. Okay, let's take a look at that. James chapter 1, verse 23. James chapter one, verse 23. For if any bear be, if, 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 uh, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding a natural face. In his natural face. His natural face in a glass. Let me explain that part. Because watch, the precepts will make sense. Faith cometh by hearing. So this person thinks that they're doing enough just by hearing the word. Imagine this is somebody who's going to church on Sunday. They're sitting down for 45 minutes and they're listening to the pastor explain these things, but they never apply them to their life. They are a hearer, but they're not a doer. The difference between the hearer and the doer is faith and works. If any be a hearer 
oh man, I got faith that this stuff is real and not a doer, but I don't never do it. He is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. The glass is a mirror and he sees what he's supposed to look like. My face is supposed to look like the face of Yahweh Shai. My natural face, is, the scripture says, when I wake, I will be uh, satisfied with his likeness. So I see myself in the mirror and I look like Yahweh Shai. Okay, keep going. Verse 24. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way. So I look at my face and I see my natural face, the reflection of Yahweh Shai, because uh, I'm hearing the word, but then I move away from the mirror. Go ahead. Straight away forgetteth what manner of man he was. And I forgot what I look like because I never applied any of this word. So this scripture is basically a mirror. It's showing you what you're supposed to look like. But if you don't do it, you get away from this scripture and you don't remember what you're supposed to look like. You don't remember what the man of Yah looks like. That's what this verse is referring to. Yeah. Yeah. Make sure you're talking in the mic. <laughs> let's go back real quick to Hebrews chapter six, because we have to get to the complicated part now. So that first part tells you that you're supposed to progress. This second part tells you that you're not supposed to regress. Hebrews chapter six, verse four. four. Hebrews chapter six, verse four. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. Pause right there. Is it possible? Now read it again. Impossible. Is or it, it is impossible. Is it possible? No. That means that this thing is an impossibility. Well, what is it? Go ahead. And have tasted. No, nope, no. Nope. Read that verse again. For it is impossible. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. What does it mean to be enlightened? To, to know the law. You got to talk in the mic. To know the law and the testimony. Okay. So hold that and let me show you what the scripture says. Go to Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. We're coming back to this Hebrew 6 if you're in a paper Bible. The scripture says, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no what? Light in them. So have they been enlightened? Because to be enlightened means you have the light in you. Okay, now take me back to the Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. What does that mean? What do they know? They know the law and the testimony and they do it. It's impossible if they were once enlightened. Go ahead. And have tasted of the heavenly gift. What's the heavenly gift? Grace. Grace. Keep going. And were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. You actually had the Holy Ghost? Keep going. And have tasted the good word of Yah. So they, they, the word is unsealed for them. They understand these precepts. The Holy Ghost speaks to them. Go ahead. And the powers of the world to come. They have received the power from the Holy Ghost. It's impossible if, verse 6. If they shall fall away. Uh-oh. To renew them again unto repentance. Uh-oh. Seeing they crucify to themselves the son of Yah afresh and put him to an open shame. What does that mean? Somebody explain what that means. He's taking in his name in vain. Yeah. If you know all of this stuff, you don't have the opportunity to abuse grace. If you know right, you're supposed to do right. Yeah. But here's the crazy thing about it. Where sin abounds... Grace much more abounds. Now, if I was to read that description to you, this person right here was enlightened. They've, they tasted grace. They're made partakers of the Holy Ghost. They can understand the word and the powers of the world to come. Verse six says, if they shall fall away. Okay. But if I described all of those things, would we say that that is a unjust man or a just man? He knows all of that stuff. He's a just man. How many times is he going to fall? Okay. He's going to fall. And what does he do? He gets back up. What does it say here? If they shall fall away. Oh, you just stayed down. The just man, if he stays down, he's a fool. Because he's already understood the precepts. Already got the law and the testimony. He's already experienced grace multiple times. 
Does that make sense? If you decide that you're just going to stay in your shame and in your vomit, it's impossible to renew you to repentance. Now, would that be blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? That would be blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. It's impossible at that point. Okay, now watch this. Let me show you the precept on that. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. Pause there. The knowledge of the truth is what we just read in the other chapter in Hebrews, right? In Hebrews 6, that person has the knowledge of the truth. If we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, go ahead. There remaineth no, sacri no sacrifice. No, read it again. Sins. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. Ah, okay. Who was our sacrifice for sins? Yahweh Shai. Okay, so if you still doing all that stuff afterwards there's no more there's no more sacrifice for sins that's you asking him to come down and die on the cross for you all over again like you didn't know keep going now it's going to tell you what there is this is what you should be looking for verse go ahead verse uh 27 but a certain fearful looking for judgment and fear and indignation so what should this person be looking for judgment and fear and indignation is it a questionable judgment no, it's certain. It's certain. Our grace is over when we die. You have every opportunity to repent for as long as you are breathing. But when you stop breathing, what should you be looking for? If you died in your sins, there is a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Now watch how it goes on in verse 28. It says, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Ain't that right? If you hated the commandments that Moses was preaching and you didn't do what he said, stones was going to start flying from anywhere. Bink, bink. That means that you didn't repent. You despised the law and you despised the sacrifice that got you, uh, that redeemed you. Okay? Now watch this. Verse 29. Of how much sorer punishment, that means worse, of how much worse punishment, suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who have trodden underfoot the son of Yah, and have counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. This is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Isaiah, Isaiah 5, would Isaiah 5, 19 be a precept? Isaiah chapter 5, verse 19. Let's take a look. That say, let him make speed and haste his work that we may see it. And let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come that we may know it. Mm, okay, so really quick, read verse 18 just for the context of this portion. Yes, sir. And for those of you that are watching online, I, I'm aware the, the video signal is pausing briefly. Don't click out of it because it does come back on after a few seconds. If you click out of it, you'll have to rejoin. Okay. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 18. Go ahead. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as it were a cart rope. Okay, watch this. Woe. What does that word mean? Warning. Destruction. Okay, destruction. Who's it coming to? To them that draw. That means to pull iniquity with cords of vanity instead of them leaving their iniquity and walking away from it they know they have iniquity and they pull it with them everywhere that they go their sins are constantly being dragged behind them because they refuse to repent it says and sin as it were with a cart rope they're pulling their sins behind them everywhere they go but this is what they say that say let him make speed i hope he hurry up and come back and hasten his work that we may see it. I can't wait till the Lord comes back. That's what they say. Amen. And they still full of sins. Amen. If you're full of sins when he comes back, you're going to receive a punishment. Okay, it says, and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come that we may know it. Mm -hmm. Now look at verse 20. This is what they're doing. Woe well, unto them that call evil good. Pause right there. What are they doing? They got it twisted. That's right. All the evil that they're doing, they call it good. If you think once saved is always saved, you, the, all, the evil, all the evil that you're doing, you're calling it good. Because once saved, always saved means you don't need to repent anymore. 
You repent just one time and then you accumulate all these sins and you pull them behind you like a little red wagon. You dragging your sins all around. Great, huh? You're calling evil good. Keep go ahead. And good evil. Wait, the good that they're calling evil. What does the scripture say is good? What's good? The law, the law is good. What do they call it? Evil. Mm -hmm. See, they got it twisted. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. Go ahead. That put darkness for light and light for darkness. Mm. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. In all of those situations, you can literally say you got it twisted. You are backwards. Mm -hmm. Keep uh, keep going. One more verse. He said, woe unto them. Woe unto, um, excuse me. woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes. Wait, are they wise in these scriptures? Wise in their own <laughs> eyes. That's conceited. They're prideful to be wise in your own eyes. Look how smart I am. Mm -hmm. That's what they're saying. Go ahead. And prudent in their own sight. Amen. That's a good precept. Very good precept. Can All right. I so, ask, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I think I might have a precept, but I'm okay. not sure. All right. Go ahead. Uh, Deuteronomy 30, verse 11. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 11. Or I guess verse 12. Okay. This whole section works. Absolutely. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 11. For this commandment, which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. So he's saying the commandment is not far from you. It's not hidden in heaven that somebody should say, man, I wish we had that word. If only we had the word, we would do the word. Mike, I need you to climb up into heaven, bro. There's a ladder on the back of the building. Climb up there, get the word, bring it to us so that we know what to do. It's not hidden from us. Keep going. Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, who shall go over the sea for us? Man, I think we need to go to Jerusalem. Somebody needs to go to Jerusalem and get a Dead Sea Scroll and read what it says so that we can know what the word really says. It's not hidden overseas or in the deep. Keep going. And bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. Keep going. But the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth. Where's the word at? In thy mouth. In thy mouth. Go ahead. And in thy heart that thou mayest do it. Okay, now watch. Let me show you the precept for this. Romans chapter 10, verse 6. Romans chapter 10, verse 6. Romans chapter 10, verse 6. But the righteous, which is of, which is of faith. The righteousness. But the, the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on the wise. On this wise. This is how the righteousness which is of faith speaks. They don't say something. They don't say, I would keep the commandments if I knew the commandments. Watch. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? What you going into heaven for? Go ahead. <laughs> that is to bring Yahweh Shai down from above. We just read that, right? Yeah. Keep going. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Yahweh Shai again from the dead. We, we don't believe that the word is hidden from us. We don't believe that you have to go somewhere and get it. We believe that it's in our mouth and in our hearts and in this Bible. Keep going. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee. The word is close to you. Even in thy mouth mm -hmm. and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Amen. That's exactly what we just read in Deuteronomy. We preach the word of faith, but faith without works is dead. So we also preach the commandments continually because in every other modern day church, they are only preaching faith with a lack of commandment. Faith without works is dead. And they'll even quote that scripture. And they'll be like, well, we do good works. We feed the homeless. We have <clears throat> a ministry overseas. I don't that, make no uh, sense. Is that first line in eight when it says, but what saith it? Is that like, but the precept says? What does the precept say? That's exactly what that means. Hallelujah. All right. Very good. Let's jump into some more. Before you move on, Prophet, can you go over um, Hebrews 10 and 29 a little deeper? <clears throat> Hebrews 10, 29. Yeah. 
Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29. So we read this one earlier. Let's go line by line with it now. Go ahead, somebody read that for us. Of how much, of how much sore punishments. So we know sore means worse. So 29 is related to 28. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. So that means nobody can be put to death in the presence of one witness. If Mimi rises up against me and it's just my word against her word, we're not going to get nowhere. But if she has this whole side of the room as a witness against me, she got two or three witnesses, then I'm going to get convicted and you guys are going to stone me for the wickedness that I did. If I don't repent, if I despise Moses' law, I'm going to die without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment would I be worthy if I received all the grace from the son of Yah and didn't care about it? Mm. Does that make sense? Hath counted the blood of the covenant, covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing. So if I'm like, yo, Yahweh's blood didn't do nothing for me. And there's a lot of people out there who think that. They don't believe in him. But these same people are not making sacrifices. So uh, a modern day Israelite, a real Israelite, who does not believe in Yahweh Shai, there's very little difference between them and a Jewish person. Let me explain. A Jewish person does not believe that the, that Yahweh Shai is the Messiah. They don't believe that he's the propitiation for their sins, and they have no temple to make sacrifices in. So they've been carrying around their sins for 2,000 years, pulling it behind them like a cart rope, because there's no way for them to be forgiven for these things. There's only two ways to be forgiven. Either, either it's animal sacrifice or you acknowledge the sacrifice that Yahweh Shai made. Okay, so Jewish people, they don't believe in the Messiah. So they're carrying around their sins for the last 2,000 years. But so are blood-born Israelites who do not believe that the Messiah is the son of Yah and that he is the propitiation of our sins. When you're talking to those people, you need to know for 100% fact you are talking to a sinner. Does that make sense? That person revels in their sin because they refuse to acknowledge the sacrifice of how much sorer punishment do you think that person is worthy who has counted the blood of the covenant an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. About to get it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Hallelujah. And for, those, and for those who believe that um, they're wait, they're still waiting for, for the Messiah to show up on earth. So when, when mm -hmm. the son of perdition shows up, the Antichrist, a false savior, that's who they're going to accept as their, as their savior. Yeah. And is that why they think that sacrificing this red heifer is going to do Yes. Something? They have, their, their whole thing is they have to get the temple back. Without the temple, they can't make any sacrifices. They've got this red heifer already prepared because they're planning to get the temple back soon. They're planning for the coming of their Messiah, which would be the first coming of their Messiah. That is the Antichrist, right? So they're going to see him and receive him and gladly accept him. And he's going to reinstitute animal sacrifices. And that is going to be the greatest blasphemy. That's when we know the abomination, the desolation is standing in the holy place. And the whole world is convinced because the whole world thinks that those people that live in the land are the children of Israel. They think they're the Jews. So everyone is going to be celebrating along with them. And we, if we stand up and say that man is the Antichrist, we will be persecuted and killed. Hallelujah. Does that make sense? Hallelujah. Okay. One more verse. I want to show you just to further expound on that. Uh, Hebrews 10, 29. Go to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. Hebrews chapter two, verse three, it says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by Adonai and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. How were we going to escape the damnation except we believe that he is the perfect final sacrifice? If you don't believe that you're going into the lake of fire. Does that make sense? Yes, All right. What else we got? All right, so the next one is That's probably going on yesterday. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, the next one is, uh, what does Isaiah 4, 1 mean? We're going to Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1. And in that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our, our own bread and wear our own apparel, but let us be called by thy name and take away our reproach. To take away our to reproach. Away our reproach. All right, let's break it down line by line. In that day, in what day? In the day in which we flee out of Babylon, okay, in the day of the great tribulation, seven women shall take hold of one man. What kind of man is he? He's a handsome man like your boy. He's, oh, wait, no. Uh, he's an Israelite. He might even look like G. <laughs> he might. <laughs> he going to look just like Gary. Seven women going to grab hold of Gary's fringes, and they're going to say, we will eat our own bread. Do you got to feed him? And we will wear our own apparel. Do you have to provide their raiment? No. Only let us be called by thy name. What does that mean? Be our covering. Be our husband. Why? To take away our reproach. Okay, now watch. Let me show you the precept for that verse. Go to Exodus chapter 21, verse 10. Because if a man takes a second wife, there is two things that he needs to take care of. And she's saying, you ain't even got to take care of that stuff with me. Just let me get the name of Israel on me. Right? Exodus chapter 20, verse 10. Go ahead. If he take him another wife, her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage shall he not diminish. Look, her food, she said, we'll cook our own, we'll make our own bread. Her raiment, she's like, we'll wear our own clothes. And her duty of marriage, she didn't say nothing about that. She's like, you still got to do what you got to do. <laughs> that's what... That's what it was, oh, it's Exodus chapter 21, verse 10. Exodus 21, verse 10, right? You see it? There's three things that he must take care of. Because, because if he doesn't, he has to take care of that last one, right? That's what's going to make her his wife. If he take him another wife or seven other wives, their food, their raiment, and their duty of marriage shall he not diminish. Verse, and, and look, and if he do not these three unto her, then she shall go out free without money. She's renegotiating the contract. She's like, look, I can cook my own food, player. I got a house. I got a room full of Chanel. I just need you to be my husband and take this reproach off of me. I need to be joined to the house of Israel. Watch. Well, it's a picture of your house, Shire. Amen. Amen. It is. It is. Okay, watch this. Um, let me show you the preset for that one. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> Go to uh, Zechariah chapter 8, verse 23. Uh, yep, yep, for both of those verses that we just saw. I need to get to that question by I am Ron. Make sure I get to that next. He's in there. I am Ron. Okay. Zechariah chapter 8, verse 23. This is a precept for where I just came from. Uh, give me verse 22 to start off with. Yeah. Many people and strong nations shall come to seek Yahweh, the Lord of hosts. Yahweh Sabaoth. Yahweh Sabaoth in Jerusalem. Uh-huh. And to pray before Yahweh. Okay, so are they making war or are they coming to worship? Coming to worship. They're coming to worship. How are they going to get there? They don't know how to get there. They need to follow the children of Israel. So these seven women are grabbing hold of one man who was an Israelite. But look at verse 23. Thus said Yahweh Sabaoth, in those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the, na of the nations. And even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, we will go with you, for we have heard that Yah is with you. You got to see this scripture is powerful because you are a seed and you have to multiply. When you go, you got seven women and ten, ten men with you and you're bringing all of them to present them to the most high. The seed has to multiply. Does that make sense? So that's an amazing scripture. Seven women have grabbed hold of you like, yeah, I'm with you now. And 10 men have grabbed on to your fringes, the skirt, right? That word that is used there tells you it's the extremity of your garment. It's a kanap. Okay. 
wing, extremity, edge, winged, border, corner, shirt. What's on the border of my shirt? These fringes. How did they know that I was an Israelite? Because of these fringes. So 10 men said, get him. and Get him. Because I want to go pray before the Most High. And I know that he knows the Most High. All right. So there's uh, two people asking the same question. Okay, so the go. single ladies need a man in the wilderness. That's what they're asking. Do the single ladies need a man in the wilderness? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, just, just get it. I sing it. Do the single ladies need, so here's the real question. Watch this. Uh, or here's the real question is, does she need a covering for her head? Yes, she does. Who's going to build that tabernacle for her? Who's going to put a physical covering over her head? There is an order to this thing. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is the man, and the head of Christ is Yah. Okay, so so does does Christ need a head? Does Christ need a head? Yes. Verse 3 says, I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. Does every man need a head? How can the body move without the head? Your body is dead if it has no head. You can't think, you can't balance, you can't talk. Okay, so Christ has a head. The man has a head. Why are we thinking that the woman doesn't need a head? The woman is the body. These two shall become one flesh. Who's going to protect her? She's going to protect herself? She got five kids, four kids, however many kids you got. You out there in the wilderness and you're by yourself. Somebody got to protect you. I know that we're a village and we're protecting ourselves. But let every man have his own wife and every woman have her own husband is what the scripture says. That part that I just said? Yes. Okay. First Corinthians chapter seven. Verse 20. Yep, that's it. Oh, no, that's not it. Well, watch this. First Corinthians chapter seven. Oh, yeah, chapter seven, verse Hold on. Uh, verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2. So, uh, to answer Cole, it looks like it's pronounced Cole. Let me know if I'm pronouncing that right. Cole Shelley. Uh, she says, what if the woman doesn't have a husband? Would Christ be her head? Spiritually, yes. How many levels are we operating on? Three, Three levels. Spiritual? Mental and physical. So spiritually, Christ is her head. But there's a physical element to this thing also. All right, go ahead. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2. Uh, Tasha, read that, please. That was the one you was asking about. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. And let every woman have her own husband. Okay. That's what I just quoted. That's what it is. It's You guys, you have to understand, um, we've only ever lived in modern society. We are going back into biblical times. When we flee to the mountains, biblical times. There's no police showing up. There's nobody regulating anything. And all of this Old Testament stuff is going to become super real at that point. When we flee from the mountains into the wilderness, I want you to know you're a single woman and you're walking along with this big old group of people. And there's a single man and he decides that he just he wants you. Okay, now we got to go to these laws and say, if that man finds you in a field and takes advantage of you and you don't scream, there's a law that goes along with that. Does that make sense? The Bible tells you how to handle all of these situations to avoid problems when there's no massa to govern over you. Now, that's going to be real difficult because, you know, why are y'all laughing? All right. All right. I'm not going to look even look in there because. All right. What else do we have? <laughs> oh, yeah. The question. I couldn't find your Who's? Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm Ron. Let me let me get that because uh, I got it right here. 
let me find that. Okay, I am Ron says there is a teaching that the coming gathering is going to take place by Yahweh and not Yahweh Shai. Can you give the biblical support that this is a false teaching and that Yahweh Shai is the one returning? Yeah, this is easy. I can do this in one verse. Huh? Yeah, this this. I appreciate that question. So uh, let me clarify it, though. The Spirit is, is reminding me that all things that the Father does, he does through Yahweh Shai. All the things that Yahweh Shai does, he does through his angels. Okay, so who's doing it? The Father is doing it, but he's doing it through the Spirit and through the Word. Okay, so it's going to happen by the will of the Father. But the physical gathering is going to be done by Yahweh Shai at his coming, but he's not going to physically do it. The physical, the manifestation of it is going to happen by the angels. So whose will is it? It's the Father's will. Whose work is it? It's Yahweh Shai's. Who's on Yahweh Shai's team? The angels. Now let me show you that real quick. Genesis chapter 49, verse 10. We're going to take a look at, uh, I got two verses in my mind. All right, go ahead. Genesis chapter 49, verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. What's the scepter? The rod of authority. The authority shall not depart from Judah. Who's from the tribe of Judah? Yahweh Shai is. Go ahead nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. Who Shiloh? Christ. That is Yahweh Shai. Go ahead. And until him. And shall... unto who? Christ. Unto your Shiloh, Yahweh Shai. Go ahead. The gathering of the people be. So who's going to gather the people? Yahweh Shai is going to gather the people. Is he physically going to run around and gather them up? No. Go to, Re go to Matthew chapter 24, and it's going to tell you how they're going to actually get gathered. Matthew chapter 24, verse 30 and 31. Matthew chapter 24, verse 30 and 31. Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in the heaven. That's the lightning shining from the east to the west. Go ahead. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. Every single person is going to mourn when he comes back. Even us. It's, it's the greatest day in our whole life, but Amen. we will still be mourning. Amen. You will be like, I really pray that I am worthy. <laughs> Let me repent some more. Hallelujah. Some more. Let me re just keep repenting. Keep going. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Okay, so he's coming. And is he about to gather everybody up? Nope, he's going to sound an alarm that lets the angels know it's time to gather us up. Keep going. And he shall send his angels with, great, with, a great, with a great sound of a trumpet. That's the alarm. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Okay, so you see, this is the will of the Father. The Father said, I will fetch you from wherever you are. But he's not going to actually do it. Yahweh Shai is going to do it, but he's not actually going to do it. He's going to send his angels to do it. Whose will is it? It's the father. So to answer, I am Ron's question. That's not a false teaching. It's a misunderstanding. The father is going to do the gathering through Yahweh Shai and the angels. Amen. Can you say it? You said it the first time you said the will is Talking to Mike. The first time when you said it, you said the will is Yah. Yep. The work is Yahweh Shai. Yahweh Shai, yeah. angels. Yeah. The labors. Yeah. If we're if we're like putting it in, so uh, Yahweh is the one who says, "Let's make a building," and then he calls Yahweh Shai and says, "You are the foreman." And Yahweh Shai gathers up his angels and they do the actual work. Okay. Think about it that way. All right. What else we got? Oh, I have a quick question, really quick. Okay. Um, it's in Psalms eight, verses six. Uh, and I'm asking this question because each day in regards to our uh, challenge of the chosen, we want to pick a scripture out, break it down. And okay. Learn on it. Are you trying to get a cheat code? Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, that's, that's good. He didn't even deny it. He's like, uh, I need, go ahead. I need these cheat codes. So in there, I, I wanted to know 
if he's talking about the son, is this us, the sons of men, or is this Yahweh Shai in chapter 6? Okay, so wait, chapter 6, chapter 8? Uh, chapter 8, verse 6. Okay, start this at verse 4 to get the context. There are certain scriptures that have to run together. You'll notice that. So uh, you see, even chapter 6 can't be the end of it because there's a colon at the end of chapter 6. So we're in Psalms chapter 8, verse 4. Go ahead. What is man that thou art mindful of him? So what is any old regular man? What is Adam, the first Adam, that you even care about him? Go ahead. And the son of man. Not son of men. Son of man. That's Yahweh Shai. Okay, right. Go ahead. That thou visitest him. Now watch. Now he's talking about Yahweh Shai, and it makes it very clear. Verse 5. For thou hast made him a, low, uh, a little lower than the angels. Was Yahweh Shai able to fly around and do all the stuff that the angels do when he walked on the earth? No, he was made a little lower than the angels. Go ahead. And has crowned him with glory and honor. But he is crowned with glory and honor. Verse 6. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Mm. Thou hast put all things under his feet. So is it talking about man or is it talking about the son of man? Okay, and this is, okay, this is why my question goes there, right? Because when I was breaking it down, the, when it went to the cross references, it kept taking me back to Genesis. Mm. Uh, See, I know. It, yeah, it was taking me to Genesis 1 6 is where my confusion came in. Genesis oh, yeah. 1 6? Okay, it, yeah. huh? Yeah, so those cross references I told you they're not always precepts. Right. That's why when I you're looking for precepts. Yeah, I stopped and I was looking at it. Yeah. and I was like, okay, this was kind of throwing me off in regard because I didn't, you know, because in these, in these cross references, it uses some of the same wording. Sometimes it does. No. Right. Um, so watch. Let me show you an actual precept. I have a precept. Oh, what you got? Huh? Uh, Hebrews chapter one. That's what I was going to. Hallelujah. That was Psalms 8, 6, and our precept is Hebrews. Go ahead, break it down, Aki. Uh, Hebrews 1, uh, let's start at 3. Okay. It says, who being, um, who, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image in his, uh, an express image of his person. So hold on real quick. Let me. Uh, so Hebrews chapter one, verse one, let's go there be so that you can, this is the very beginning of it. And you need to see the context to find out who the, who is it says, yeah, who at sundry times and in divers manner spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Okay. How did Yah speak to us in time past fathers by, by the, the prophets. prophets? Give me verse two. Hath in these last days, let's pause right there. How long has the last days been around? We know it's been around since they wrote the book of Hebrews because he thought it was the last days and Timothy wrote the book of Hebrews. The Bible proves that. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Let me pause right there. There are some people who read this verse and they say there are no more prophets because all the speaking that was done from that point forward was all done by Yahweh Shai. That doesn't make any sense. Because even in, so even in Revelation, it says thou must prophesy again. The, John the Revelator is told you must prophesy again. So there are still prophets in the world today. Does that make sense? To prophesy means to speak the testimony of Yahweh Shai. Okay. So Yahweh, the father in these last days spoke unto us by Yahweh Shai, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. That's what it said in uh, Psalms, right? By whom also he made the worlds. Who made the worlds? The father did. Who did he make them by? By Yahweh Shai. Okay, does that make sense? Keep going. Verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory. Who's the brightness of his glory? Yahweh Shai is the brightness of the father's glory. Go ahead. And the express image of his person. Uh-huh. And upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Okay, now watch this line, verse 4. Being made so much better than the angels. Pause right there. He was made a little lower as the angels when he was a man. When he resurrected, he is now so much better than the angels. Now, what is he? He's the son of Yah. What are the angels? They are the son of Yah. Are they equal? No, he is so much better than all of them. Does that make sense? Go ahead, one more. 
as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Amen. Does that make sense, everybody? All right. Hallelujah. Yeah, let's get it in. Oh, you got some, Jesse, talking to Mike. So, yeah, I was shy. Yeah, I was shy is the answer. I got, a, I got a question about the fivefold ministry. I want to be able to understand it so that I can um, fill my role completely mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. righteously. And in doing the study, I, uh, I came across Micah 2.11, which is really unrelated. But unrelated to the fivefold ministry? Fivefold ministry. Okay. I was looking up everything with certain, certain words, but... When I was reading this, I didn't understand it. It's, it's Micah 2.11. Hmm. Okay. So it's not related. So what we're talking about is what does Micah 2.11 mean? Not related to the fivefold ministry. And then on the fivefold ministry. Now we're going to come back to that. We got to deal with this first because he said this is not related to the fivefold ministry. So I don't want to get that confused. All right. Micah chapter 2, verse 11. Go ahead. If a man walking in the spirit. And falsehood do lie. So if a man who is walking in the spirit and falsehood do lie, go ahead. Say, I will prophesy unto thee of wine and of strong drink. What is he prophesying to you of? He's, he's drunk. He's prophes what is it that's causing him to prophesy? He's, he's the his... wine and the strong drink. So what spirit does he have in him? Spirits. Strong drink. He's prophesying out of his drunkenness. Keep going. He shall even be the prophet of this people. We would select somebody who was clearly drunk. Have you guys ever heard of drunk in the spirit? Yeah. Who believes that there, that that's a such thing? Christians do. When, when they feel the Holy Ghost hitting them and they start stumbling and rolling on the ground, what do they say? He's drunk in the spirit. What? There's no drunk in the spirit scripture. The only people who ever thought somebody was drunk in the spirit was the people on the day of Pentecost who heard these men speaking in different languages. And they said, these men are drunk. Acts chapter 2. Didn't they say that about Yahweh Shai too, though? Not that he was drunk. They called him a, a, a wine bibber, right? Okay, so if a man walking in the spirit and falsehood do lie... What is he walking in? He's walking in the spirit and falsehood, the spirit of falsehood. He's walking in the spirit of lies. And this is what he says. I will prophesy unto thee of wine and of strong drink. What is the influence for his prophecy? The alcohol that he's drinking. Even he shall be the prophet of this people. He's saying, we don't have enough discernment to select a real prophet. We are willing to follow people who prophesy out of anything. Does that make sense? That's what was confusing me. Ah, okay. It's very confusing. Yeah. That's what he is talking about. And then, and then wine, wine in this sense also uh, refers to false doctrine. Yeah. Being drunk off the false yep. doctrine. Amen. False doctrine. Amen. All right. Prophet, I have a question. I yes. I know we've um, already moved from what we were talking about. But You're trying I to go back? Question. How far are we going back? Not too far. Oh, not too far back. Okay, go. Okay, so when... You were saying about, well, when we were reading in the scripture about seven um, women. Hold on real quick. One. When we were talking about seven women taking hold of one man. Mm -hmm. Okay. And about a woman having to, or needing to have a cover when we go into the wilderness. Yes. What about the widows? What about. That's a good that point. Divorced. What about the widows? We have a commandment of Yahweh Shai concerning the widows and the fatherless. Why? Because neither one of them have a covering. So every man that is able is supposed to take care of the widows and the fatherless. It don't say take care of these single women who need to have them a husband. A real widow. <laughs> a real widow. A real widow. She doesn't have a covering. A single woman could have a covering. And she's not complete until she does. <laughs> all right uh, hallelujah is that is that quava to protect them that's right that's what we are called to do we are repeated what you got you're getting it yep you good okay uh just go back just a tad uh 
Matthew 24, 30, 31. I was trying to get a question in, but okay. we got to roll it real, real strong. Really quickly, before we jump back there, this question from Robin, it says, what about the women who are married whose husband didn't go into the wilderness with them? What happens to them? Okay. To what happens to the women or what happened to the husband who didn't go into the wilderness? Right. Okay. So I got to answer both parts of the question. What happens to the husband who was disobedient and didn't go into the wilderness? He did. He did. He did. He did. Right. Does that make sense? Your husband is going to be dead. You were bound by the law for as long as your husband liveth. But if he be dead, she is free to marry another. Does that make sense? Okay. So there's going to be a whole lot of people who refuse to get out of Babylon. Go back to Micah. We're still in Micah chapter 2. Take a look at verse 10. This is the verse right before what we read. Micah chapter 2 verse 10. Arise ye and depart. For this is not your rest. Because it is polluted, it shall destroy you. Even mm. with the sore destruction. Okay, so you need to get up out of here. Just because your husband refuses to leave the wilderness. What did Shai say? He said, suppose ye that I came to send peace on earth. I tell thee nay, but rather a sword. And your foes are going to be the people in your own house. But when it comes time to make that final decision, you have a husband or a wife that has been completely disobedient and will not follow these commandments. And you are saying, I can prove to you in the scriptures that this is our final warning. And they're like, go ahead. But before you leave, cook me a pork chop. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm going to leave you. Arise ye and depart for this is not your rest. Your rest has not come yet because it is polluted. It shall destroy you even with a sore destruction. There's time to go. Now watch. Read verse 9. The woman of my people have ye cast out from their pleasant houses. What? That guy. Well, go ahead then. That's what he says. It's crazy that we're on this scripture. He's like, you leaving me? Go ahead and go. She's like, I have to go. I want you to come with me, but you don't want to come. The women of my people have ye cast out from their pleasant houses. Go ahead. From their children have ye taken away my glory forever. Mm. Arise ye and depart. If the woman gets cast out because the man don't want to come, let that Roman woman rise up and depart. She's going into the wilderness. Her husband is going to stay in Babylon. What's going to happen to him in Babylon? He's going to die. Okay, go ahead. Can, can you explain? Yesterday, we were saying, um, we were reading how he's going to bring all of Israel. Mm -hmm. How does this tie into that? Or is that, mm, that mic is, hold, hold it up. Is your mic still on? Yeah. Okay, it's his mic that's doing that. Okay, so. All of Israel is going to be gathered. So I'm going to explain that. All of Israel is going to be gathered. If you don't go, what does that mean? You wasn't Israel to begin with. I don't care what, how dark your skin was, was or how kinky your hair was. You might have looked like you was an Israelite, but you weren't. Does that make sense? There's a whole lot of tares out there pretending to be wheat. But when the time comes, we're going to find out who the real wheat are. And so when the gathering, so when the gathering comes, no, talk, oh yeah, you're when the good. gathering comes, now we get separated in tribes. No, correct? so he's just going to gather us. We all get gathered, all of Israel. We okay, get so gathered. So when does the separation from husband and wife co come apart? Like, so when is what do you mean separation? Every man for themselves. There, so oh, there's no every man for themselves well, because we're a body rod, and he's the head. Right. Well, when you go under the rod. Like, you know what I mean? We're standing in a yourself. big old giant field, the Valley of Decision, and he's standing there. And I want you to imagine a shepherd, and he has his staff, and he has all of his sheep, and he's preparing to bring his sheep into his pasture. So he lays out his rod, and his sheep pass under his rod, and he's raising it and lowering it. He's examining each one of the sheep to make that sure that they're his and there's no wolves in there. Everyone is passing underneath this rod and they are being translated. We are the sheep. Yahweh Shai is the shepherd. Does that make sense? Once you are translated, you might walk in, your wife might walk in right behind you, and you were one flesh, but you guys are separate now. 
you are both the sons of Yah. You mean all eight of us. <laughs> he said, <laughs> he said, this dude got plans. He's got plans. Look, he just, he just, he just waiting. All right. Um, okay. Mo, what you got? Okay. Um, back with um, Matthews. Matthew chapter 24. 30 and 31. And I'm wondering, um, is that anywhere related to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17? Yes, it is. But one of them is true and the other one is false. So let's go to that 1 Thessalonians. And if you could turn off your mic when you're not talking in it. First Thessalonians. Where are we going? First Thessalonians chapter four. What is that ringing? Hello? Who? Oh, that's you? Four sixteen. Is that what you said, Mo? First Thessalonians chapter four. Okay. Oh yes, this is, I'm sorry. I was thinking of a different Thessalonian scripture. This is directly related to what we just read in Matthew 24. So first Thessalonians chapter four, verse 15. For I'll deny himself. Shall the, the question. So the question is, is Matthew 24, 30 and 31 related to first Thessalonians four, uh, 15, 16 to 17, and the answer is yes, it is a direct precept. Okay, based on that. Uh, well, we haven't read it yet. You want to read? Oh, oh, what, what did you say? Uh, we haven't read it yet. Do you want to read it or you just want to know if I it was related? read it too, but oh. I, I want to say, narrate that a little bit. That's not the, I'm just saying what I'm thinking about right now. Okay. okay. Uh, I was thinking about, um, you know, um, the pre trip, the middle trip, and the end as far as wait the, 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 you uh, said pre yeah the, the no pre talk say that again in the mic the pre-tribulation that is talked about the middle tri uh -huh. tribulation is spoken yeah and you hear different conversations on these things yeah and you know about being caught up you know you always use the example poofed and all yep. that you know what i mean poofed but poofed you know poofed up in the air or whatever you know but i'm saying um this is clearly saying to you're, you're so far away from the signal. Go ahead. This is clearly saying to me that the, there's not going to be a rapture. There's not going to be a rapture. I'm in, so I'm trying but to actually if, have a conversation with different people. Well, no, here's the thing, okay. Amo. If you wanted there to be a rapture, you would be able to read this verse and say, to me, clearly there's going to be a rapture because of this verse. Exactly. So people that are under the strong delusion, the, the most high gives them that delusion. You can't talk somebody out of a strong delusion if the Most High gives it to them. All the scriptures that they read are going to support the delusion that they have. Even though this scripture makes it very clear and you're able to see it, there is no rapture in this verse. Somebody else is going to use this verse to support the, uh, the opposite okay. idea. All right. Now, now go to Okay. Would those be unclean spirits that make that lead these people to look for certain things in the scriptures nope. to have them contradict things? It's not an unclean spirit. The Most High doesn't use unclean spirits. Okay. He only uses evil spirits. Right? Mm. Weren't, you weren't at that Bible study? Yeah, but I didn't hear that. The Most High uses evil spirits to execute whatever he wants. Evil spirits and unclean spirits are not the same spirits. An evil angel is an evil spirit. Does that make sense? Remember Saul, King Saul, what happened? He had the spirit of the most high. The spirit left him and an evil spirit from Yahweh was sent unto him. We covered that in a recent Bible study. Yeah, so uh, as I recall, the, um, the evil spirit is used by Yah. The unclean spirit is the, are the Nephilim. Unclean spirits are the spirits of okay. the Nephilim. Yes. The evil spirits are the angels. Let me just show you that really quick. Go to Psalms 78, 49. He cast upon them the fierceness of his anger, wrath, 
and indignation and trouble by sending evil angels among them. All right. I'm sorry. Well, we were talking about um, evil spirits and unclean spirits. The different. Okay. So this is and he. Evils, yeah. He cast upon them the fierceness of an his anger. So that's the Most High. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and then if you also look at um, the Israel's first king, uh, when he um, the mo uh, the Most High sent an evil spirit to him. It wasn't an unclean spirit. It was an evil spirit. And that's when he was like throwing the javelin at uh, David and stuff like that. Every time he would be playing the harp, that evil spirit would leave him. So it's not unclean spirits, it's evil spirits. And the unclean spirits are um, the offspring of the Nephilims. And when during the flood, that's how we got um, uh, unclean spirits, devils and all that, what they were talking about. All right. And that one, that one snuck in through, uh, the one we're talking about with Saul, that, that one snuck in through jealousy. Through jealousy? Through jealousy, yeah. He, he was envious um, over, over David. No. Okay. Um, I'm going to wait on this next one. Let me see if I can pick a different one of these answers. Okay. This is regarding the spirits. the spirits, First Samuel through seventeen. Oh. You got a mic. Okay, so the reason why um, Saul, why it. it um, the reason why the Most High departed from Saul was because he was disobedient. Right. Um, he was told to do something, to wait for uh, Samuel to come and uh, make the offering, and he started panicking because he saw the armies coming, and he said, I'm going to make this sacrifice myself. And after he did that, uh, the Most High left him. So uh, in 14 it says, But the spirit of Yahweh departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from Yahweh troubled him. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold, now an evil spirit from Yah troubleth thee. And that's the reason why um, he got the evil spirit, because he was disobedient. Love you. Thank you. So it's also, I, I wrote down from that study, is the unclean spirit is not from Yah. Satan still needs permission to touch whomever. Yes. He, um, he most definitely needs permission, because he can't do anything. So when that... Um, when he is cast out in Revelation, that's when he's able to do whatever. And but right now, he still is able to go up and, and, and talk, and he must get permission to touch anybody. Does, is that permission just to touch the Israel, or is that anybody? Just yeah, we don't, we don't know. So. Just curious. I also have Judges 9.23 for that one. Say it again. Judges 9.23. Then Yah sent an evil spirit between Amalek, Amalek and the men of Shem, Shechem, and the men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Amalek, Abimelech. Amen. That's a I good precept. Question. Yes. How does um, uh, <clears throat> Yah's evil spirit coincide or tie in or does it tie wait in? say an evil spirit from yah yeah an evil spirit from yah <laughs> okay how does it tie in or does it tie in or coincide with a strong delusion that's mm. also sent by yah okay let me you got a precept go i appreciate it. we talked about this um first kings chapter 22 and verses uh 20 through 29 oh she got them notes first kings First Kings uh, chapter 22. 22, verse 19. First Kings chapter 22, verse 19. And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of, the, of Yahweh. I saw Yahweh sitting in, 
on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left hand. What are the host of heaven? The angels. The angels. So he saw Yahweh sitting on his throne and he saw all the angels on the right hand and on the left hand. We covered this, right? Who's on his right hand? Yahweh Shai. Okay. Who's on his left hand? That's right. Think of it as angels and devils. On this side, it's all positive. On this side, it's all negative. Right? Satan has a place in heaven right now. He's going to get thrown out of that place. Okay, go ahead. Verse 20. And Adonai said. Yahweh said. And Yahweh said, who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth, Gilead? And one said on this manner. And another said on that matter. So all the angels are counseling with the most high saying, who's going to do this thing that I need to get done. Go ahead. And there came forth a spirit and stood before Yahweh and said, I will persuade him. He, this one's very confident, isn't he? He's prideful. Go ahead. And Yahweh said unto him, wherewith? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, thou shalt persuade him. And he prevail. And prevail also. And prevail also. Go forth and do so. So there's an example of Yahweh sending a evil spirit to make a man believe something and do something because he believes it. Make sense? Let's get to some of these questions online. They're stacking up. I want to get through a bunch of those. Go talking to Mike. So uh, in 2 Chronicles uh, 20, 26. 2 Chronicles 20, verse it's 26. It's talking about this valley of, I'm going to butcher the name. They want to know if that's the same one at, as the valley of Jehoshaphat in Joel 3, 2. Okay, the valley of Barakah. 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 <clears throat> okay. Uh, Second Chronicles chapter 20, the valley of Barakah, verse 26. Watch this. I'm going to show you how to find the answer. Read and verse 26, please. And on the fourth day, they assembled themselves in the valley of Barakah, for they were blessed, for, um, for, they, for they blessed Yahweh. Therefore, the name of the same place was called the valley of Baraka unto this day. Okay, so what? How would we pronounce that word? Baraka. It's a blessing. It's the valley of blessing. When I say Baraka, Baraka Ta, bless you. So the valley of blessing. Okay, it has an e in it. Hold your finger down on the word. Go to Strong's. It's a ba ra ka ha, Baraka. Okay, it's pronounced Baraka. Scroll down to the Brown Driver Briggs definition. It tells you exactly what we need. It says, blessing. Look at B. A valley in the wilderness near Tekoa where Jehoshaphat and his people assembled to bless Yahweh after the overthrow of the host of the Moabites. So the answer is yes. But you don't have to go in there in order to do that. The Bible will tell you everything. If you just keep reading, verse 27. Then they returned every man of Judah in Jerusalem and Jehoshaphat in the forefront of them to go again to Jerusalem with joy. For Yahweh had made them to rejoice over their enemies. Okay. So that is the valley of Jehoshaphat. That's where you, Jehovah sat. Jehoshaphat is where Jehovah sat. <clears throat> That's where he will sit to judge the people in the valley of blessing. For some people, it's going to be cursing. That's the reason why the name of it will be forever changed once we get there to the Valley of Decision. It's people's final place to make a decision. Either you're going to serve Yah or you're going to serve yourself. Okay. <clears throat> Keep going. Let's, let's work uh, through these. Uh, the next one is, can you explain 2 Ezra 6, 9? And is it the same as Isaiah 14, 21 through, or 12 through 21? That's crazy. I'm, I'm already here in Isaiah. Ezra, I was reading this recently. Second Ezra chapter six, verse nine. Okay. <laughs> it's crazy, right? Okay. We quoted this verse yesterday during the service. 
Second, second Ezra chapter six, verse nine. Go ahead. For Esau is the end of the world, and Jacob is the beginning of it that followeth. Okay, so Esau is the progenitor of what people? The Edomites. Jacob is the progenitor of what people? Israelites. The Edomites are the end of the world. And the Israelites are the beginning of the world that comes after Esau. The picture of that is Esau came out first and Jacob was holding on to his heel. Right? Okay. Now, they're wanting to know, is that related to the Isaiah scripture? Give me the Isaiah. Isaiah 14, 12 through 21. Okay, let's get that. <clears throat> Second Ezra chapter six, verse nine. Now we're going to read this section in, in Isaiah chapter 14, but the answer is no, it is not related. So what the second Ezra scripture is not related to the Isaiah 14 scripture. The Isaiah 14 scripture is talking about a completely different group of people, but we're going to go ahead and cover it because it has a word in it that has uh, confused people for a very long time. A title. We were a resurrection as well, right? Say again. Would they think this would be the resurrection? The resurrection? Resi re I don't even know how to say. The that. Isaiah verse? Yeah. No, 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 no. It's 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 unrelated to what we read in Esdra. So to explain Esdra, Esau is the end of the world, and Jacob is the beginning of the world to come. Okay. So when Esau is finished reigning. His reign is completely put down under the feet of Yahawashai. Then the reign of Jacob, then the, the real world will be manifested with the real ruler of the world, which is Yahawashai. That's a completely separate issue. Now we're going to talk about the king of Tyre, the king of Babylon and Lucifer, which are not related to the other subject. Isaiah chapter 14. Let's start at verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Okay, there's a problem right here. Let me explain this problem. This word Lucifer is a Latin word. It only has a Latin meaning. But we're reading in the book of Isaiah and the Latin language had not yet been invented. So that is not what they said right there. However, it does say Lucifer. And what does everybody think Lucifer means? Like Satan. Lucifer is not Satan. It is not a name for Satan. It means day star. So hold your finger down on the word Lucifer. It means, it means, it means morning star. Day star, morning star. I, I get those. We're going we're gonna to confirm which one it is. No, no. So his name is a copy of Yahawashai's title. Yahawashai is the bright morning star. He's also the day star. Lucifer's Lucifer, Satan's name is a copy of you. everything he does is a copy, right? For that reason, uh, here in this verse, this verse is translated Lucifer, a Latin word that did not exist at the time that this was spoken. It was chosen to be put in there, but they capitalized it. When we look at this word, you're going to find out it's not supposed to be capitalized. It's not a name. It's not a pronoun. Okay, here we go. Hold your finger down on the word Lucifer. Nope. So first let's examine the strongs. Look at the original word. Doesn't it look like hell if you flip it backward? H-E-L-L. -L, see those two lines? In the Hebrew. Yeah, it looks like hell, right? And it sounds like hell, don't it? How you pronounce it? Hayalal. Hayalal. Okay. Strong's definition. In the sense of brightness, the morning star. This word comes from H 1984. You see that touch H 1984. And it's going to give you the original word without the E in it. Does that make sense? This is how it's pronounced. This is ancient Hebrew halal. Okay. What does it mean? To shine, to shine. Now watch, look over here at our, our uh, chart and find the letter N. The letter N, so across the top is our modern Hebrew, but we're looking for Na. Find the Na. What is it a picture of? A snake creeping down. What is the description of the words? Look at the last one. Shiny. See? So, does that make sense? 
Okay, so if I wanted to say the word nakash, I'd have to start off with the picture of a snake slithering through the ground. If you see something shiny slithering through the ground, you instantly know what it is. It's a snake. Get away from it. Okay, so let's go back to this Hebrew right here. But go back one level, <clears throat> back to Lucifer. You're going to see that this one does not mean shine. The original word meant shiny. So we're now in the Hebrew for halal. What does it say? That's the king of Babylon. Somebody's, look, it says, and Satan figuratively. You see that? King of confusion. Yeah. But so here's the thing. It's the king of Babylon. He's talking to a man. A man that Satan has been using to execute his will. He's not talking to Satan. He's talking to a man. But there is a spiritual and a physical component. So spiritually, he's talking to Satan. Physically, he's talking to the king of Babylon. So he's talking to the worker of Satan. Yes, that's perfect. Okay, now let's go back. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 2. Go ahead, somebody read that from the top. I'm sorry, verse 12. Verse 12, that was my bad. Okay, back to 12. Wait, so just real quick, I want you to see uh, that even though we covered that there, it tells you that within the verse. How art, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut, how art thou cut down to the ground? which did weakest the nation, pause, the nation. Pause right there real quick. Because remember how I tell you the Bible is a self-defining book. So you don't have to hold your finger down on Strong's in order for it to tell you that he's talking to the king of Babylon. Just go to verse 4. Verse 4. That thou should take up this proverb against the king of Babylon. Against who? The king of Babylon. The king of Babylon is a man, ain't he? Yes, sir. Okay, keep going. And say... How has the oppressor ceased? That golden city ceased. Okay, now, you, this, is, this is a prophecy that Isaiah is speaking. So it's on a spiritual level and on a physical level. So, you shall take up this proverb against the king of confusion. Who's the king of confusion? The scripture says, for Yah is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. So who is the author of confusion? It's Satan. So this is being said spiritually to Satan, but physically to the king of Babylon. Now we jump down to verse 14 and it says, how art thou fallen from heaven? O halal son of the morning. How art thou cast down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Does that part make sense? Okay. Verse 13. Somebody pick it up. For thou Four. hast said in thine heart. Okay, pause real quick. In verse 13, we have five I wills. Because Satan's primary goal is to execute his will. We're going to look at five things that Satan says, that the king of Babylon says, that are his will. And then we're going to see the answer to these five things by five things that Yahweh says he will do in response to what is written here. Okay. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. Pause right there. Why does Satan need to ascend into heaven? He can go back and forth to heaven anytime he wants. But there is a time when he is earthbound and can no longer ascend into heaven. So that's when he says, I will ascend into heaven. That's the first I will. I will exalt my throne above the stars of Yah. That's the second one. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. What's another word for congregation? Church. He says, I will control the church. Keep going. The sides of the north. Okay, so that's how many I wills. That's three. Keep going. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. That's four. I will be like the most high. That's five. Those are the five things that he is saying. Okay, but here's the first part of the answer to him. Because when he said, I will be like the most high. This is the reason why Michael, the archangel, is making war against the dragon. Because Michael in Hebrew means who is like the most high. That's his name means I am designed to make sure that you know you are not like the most high. Does that make sense when we read in the Revelation 12? Okay, so watch this. Verse 15. I got a question real quick. Yeah. When, whenever I read like 
the north or when it speaks of the north, I always put us in that. That's situation. us. So I, when I read that, it's like Satan's controlling these, these churches out here. That's exactly what it's saying. It says, I will sit upon the mount of the congregation. If you're sitting upon the mount, you are the most high over the church in the sides of the north. That's what Satan is. He's the ruler of these churches, churches that are in North America. That's where uh, we are. I, I also see uh, like NASA. And all these things when they're ascending right. above right. the clouds right. and all that right. stuff. Right. That's right. So, 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 so I think it's insane. He is going to accomplish. accomplish, but on earth, because obviously he can't accomplish it. He's going to try to accomplish those things. Because, watch. So, the Most High begins to answer him in the next verse. 15, right? Verse 15. Go ahead. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell. Okay. What, what hell is this? Is this the grave? Kind of, because that grave is going to be thrown into the lake of fire. So he's going to combine them together. <laughs> Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell. To where? To the sides of the pit. You're going into the bottomless pit, and then I'm going to throw the bottomless pit into the lake of fire. Keep going. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that is made this the, the angel? Is this the devil? What'd they say? The man. Is this the man? Who are they looking at? A man. Okay, so they're looking at the king of Babylon. They're not looking at Satan, but both of them are going to be in the same place. Hmm. Keep going. Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened opened not the house of his prisoners they're looking at him like is this this little weak man who did you did all this stuff you down here with us keep right keep keep going <laughs> looking all weak like Cesare. right look <laughs> i know right? all the kings of the nations even all of them lie in glory so the kings of the nations every single one of them are laying in the grave. That's what he means when he says lie in glory. He doesn't mean tell lies. He means they lie in glory. That grave right there, who's in there? A king. That he has his glory. He still has his reputation. Is Keep it, is it talking to Mike. Psalms, like Psalms 1, where he talks about the council of the, of, the, of the kings of the nations and what they'll do? Like similar. Christ. Similar. Okay? That's good thinking. Is, they, this, go ahead. is this king the Antichrist? No. No, but uh, so it's not the Antichrist. Remember, there's not a the Antichrist. There is a the abomination of desolation. There are many Antichrists is what the scripture says. Okay, let's keep going. Lie in glory, everyone in his own house. Go ahead. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable brand. Mm. And as the raiment of those that are slain thrust through with a sword. That go down to the stones of the pit as a carcass trodden under feet. Can Satan be killed with a sword? This is a man we're talking about. Why does everybody say that Lucifer is Satan? He's not physically, but spiritually, I would say Halal is Satan. Lucifer, that's this is a this is an anomaly that the, that the most high allowed to be put in the Bible so that we would search it out. Right? Let's keep going. Verse 20, I'll pick it up so we can get to another. It says, thou shalt not be joined with them in burial because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. Now, that's the physical. Watch this spiritual. Prepare slaughter for his children, Satan's children. For the iniquity of their fathers that they do not rise nor possess the land nor fill the face of the world with cities. All right, let me show you that. One other thing, we need to see the Most High's answer in five parts. Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 14. Wait, that might not, let me see. Give me, give me one second. <clears throat> so precept for 13, verse 13. Uh, no, this is, this is the precept for where were we? The five I will statements that, that are made in Isaiah, but we need Ezekiel 28. We're going to start this one at verse 14. So you can see this is clearly talking about Satan. This is not talking about a man. And this is the most high's answer to him. 
Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherubim of the cover. Now read it again. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Okay. He, he says, you are an anointed cherub. What's a cherub? An angel. an angel that covereth. What was his position? He was above the most high. There are four angels. One here, one behind him, one on the right, one on the left. There used to be a fifth that was above his throne. And because he was above the throne of the most high, he would look down on the most high. And what would he say? I'm higher than the most high. That's what that verse means. He didn't climb his way up there. The most high created him to do that so that he could be filled with pride. Watch. It says, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. So how did he get to be in that position? The most high put him in that position so that he could throw him down from there. Satan didn't just come up with pride in his heart and decide to do all of this stuff. The most high orchestrated every line of these scriptures. Okay, keep going. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of Yah. Look, you've been in, you've been in heaven. Go ahead. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stone of fire. Keep going. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou hast was created. Okay, Satan was perfect in all his ways from the day that he was created until, go ahead. Till iniquity was found in thee. Oh, until iniquity was found in thee. Go ahead. Talk, talk on the mic. The iniquity was the thought that he was higher. Absolutely. You know how you, when the most high promotes you to a high position, you have to give all praise to the most high. You can't think that you got there of your own accord. No matter how high you get, all praises to the most high. Yeah. It would be iniquity. What is iniquity? Evil thoughts. I'm up here and I'm higher than he is. I look down on him. How did you get there? He put you there. Right? So the iniquity was found in him. Go ahead. By the multitude of the merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. Okay, here we go. Watch. And thou hast sinned. You have sinned. You have done something against what I created you to do. Here's, here's our five I will statements. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of Yah. That's one. And I will destroy thee. That's two. O covering cherub. From the midst of the stone of fire. That means he can no longer walk among the planets. He can no longer go back and forth. Okay. We got two of them so far. Keep going. Thine heart. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Remember, he was beautiful, right? Keep going. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Mm -hmm. I will cast thee to the ground. What number is that? Three. Go ahead. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. That's number four, right? Okay, now watch. You've got to watch very carefully. Keep going. Thou hast defiled the sanctuaries. Thy sanctuaries. Thy sanctuaries. Wait a minute. Satan has sanctuaries? Of course he does. He has synagogues. The Bible wouldn't talk about a synagogue of Satan if he didn't have churches. Go ahead. By the multitude of thy iniquities. Mm -hmm. By the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. Did that say I will? No, it said, will I? It said, therefore, will I? So that's not one of the answers. Watch, keep going. We're looking for number five. It shall devour, it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all men, in the sight them. of all them that behold thee. You see it? There's five specific I will statements, and each one answers something that, that Satan said that he was going to do. Because Satan's goal is to execute his will. But there's only one will. Satan doesn't have free will or else he would do those things. The only one who has free will is the most high. He can do anything he wants. So for anybody to have been deceived running around here thinking you got free will. Will yourself into heaven right now. Will the father off of the throne. Satan with all of his power doesn't have free will. But you think you got free will. No, you have freedom of choice, but with, you lack the power to execute your will. Satan also has freedom of choice without the power to execute his will. He would be all powerful if he could execute his will. Does that make sense? Okay. Can we go, can we go over the ranking of uh, oh, the ranks? 
that there is. I, I had a conversation at, at work with one of my coworkers, and he was speaking on the ranks and the, saying that the ranks of what? Uh, in, in in heaven and how Satan was the number one, and then I think he said. It was, was he speaking from the Bible? No, no, he was. Just, it was just a conversation at work. He was speaking out the side of his neck. <laughs> right. No, but see, yeah. I didn't know, so I was like, Oh, well, I, I'm a, I'm that's not found ask. in the scriptures. Okay. Now there are 22 types of angels. 22 different classifications, but it doesn't work the way that he's talking about. Like Satan is this. And then we have, uh, yeah. So I will attempt to answer your question or provide you with some information to have the conversation from what is in the Bible. Okay. Jubilees. Let me see. Jubilees chapter 2. Let me see how I can put this one together. This one is complicated. So, uh, as we were speaking earlier, I was explaining to you that the Father is the will, Yahweh Shai is the foreman, but the angels are the workers. Okay, there's 22 types of angels to create the 22 types of things that were created in the week of creation. Okay, the angels do all the work. The highest level of angels are called the angels of the presence. Now, Gabriel is one of those because Gabriel said, I am Gabriel. I am always beholding the face of the father is what he said. So he's one of the angels of the presence. When you read in Jubilees and you read in uh, Enoch a little bit it's going to tell you about the classifications of angels but they're not like what your partner was talking about okay Jubilees chapter 1 let's take a look at chapter 1 do we go past 1 nowadays do we do we do it the bible study oh snap sometimes we do sometimes we do if we get started late yeah yeah sometimes we do only if we get started late and this is a complicated question which will take me like like we, we're about to take a deep dive. So this is a, this is a complicated one. So let me suffice it to say, read Jubilees chapter one and chapter two. Chapter one is where we get introduced to the angels of the presence. They are always in the presence of the most high. Jubilees chapter two tells you the institution of the Sabbath, its observance by the highest angels with whom Israel is afterward to be associated. It tells you that there were 22 acts that were created during that first week. There are 22 acts because there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet because every Everything was spoken into existence using the word. So, whew, yeah, man, I'm glad you said that because I, I do have to be somewhere and we was about to go deep. Man, I sent my watch to Greg. <laughs> I sent my watch to Greg. Can I make it a little this, he, he said it back an hour so that we would be here an hour longer. Greg, I, it's not 12 o'clock. Can I make a small comment? Yes, please. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm seeing here in Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28? Yeah, I mean, we just covered it. Yep, go ahead. I'm seeing a, a coalition uh, of um, Hebrews 6, because I was always kind of wondering who was like in that type of condition of Hebrews 6 that we went over today. Who brew, Hebrews, Hebrews, Hebrews 6? 6. What, what was it talking about that you're referring to in here? You know how you can actually um, know a lot of what's going on with the scripture and the word and oh, everything and yeah. fall away from it. Hmm. I don't see that in, in the Ezekiel 28 though. You don't? Okay. No, because Ezekiel 28 is specifically talking about a cherub, specifically talking about Satan. Right. But he, oh, but you're saying how could, well, see Satan. Yeah. Yeah. I, I get what you're saying now. You know what I'm saying? Because, right, imagine you're in the presence of the exactly. Most High. You've seen all the glory. There's only one thing that can convince you that you're greater than all the glory that you saw. That thing has to be hardwired into you. Like, he knows the word. He doesn't believe it. His pride won't allow him to surrender to the will of Yahweh Shai. Does that make that sense? Word, it were 
where it comes in where he says it would have been best for you to not have known him? To not have known than to have turned away from it? Yeah, let me get that last verse. We'll cover that real quick. Yeah. That's funny because I was going to pull that precept way back at the beginning as we were talking about Hebrews, the impossible to fall away. Uh, go to Second Peter chapter 2. Verse 21, this will be our last verse that we're able to cover for tonight. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 22. 21. Started at, started at verse 20. I got to get in as much as we can. I don't want to cut nobody short. Go. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Adonai and Savior, Yahavashai HaMashiach, mm -hmm. they are again entangled therein. So I escaped from the world, and the world sucked me back in. Go ahead. And I stayed in the world. That's what it says. And overcome. overcome. That means the world overcame me. So I was righteous. I was just. I fell. I got back up. I fell again. I got back up. But on that third time, I fell, and I stayed down. Keep going. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Because there's no more grace. At the beginning of their walk, they had grace. But you chose to abuse the grace. You're just going to stay in there. Go ahead, 21. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Keep going. But if it is happened. But it is. But it is happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned again. The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that sow. the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Amen. That's the true proverb. The dog has returned to its vomit again. All right. What's up? About the um, go ahead. Ask it. I, I got up. Mine's not. I just need, uh, so I'm gonna ask one more question and then we're gonna close out. Um, I just need to know if my son using the microwave on the Sabbath a reproach on the commandment. So her her uh, son is a special needs, and um, she's tried to explain it to him before. He doesn't understand it, and she just wants to know if that is um, is there grace for him to use the microwave because he doesn't understand. So. Um, he has, she, you, she, he has special needs? Yes. But he's able to operate the microwave himself? Yes. Okay. So I would say, um, this is just me, if it was my son, I would unplug that thing and provide something else for him. Um, because it's, it's up to you as a parent to prepare that for him. Um, but the scriptures also say it, it is, um, it's okay to do well on the Sabbath. But this is something that's not uh, life-threatening. So, it's for you. It, go ahead. So uh, the son is operating the microwave, but he has special needs, which means she explains to him, you can't cook on the Sabbath, but he doesn't understand that. His special needs is preventing him from understanding what that means. Yes. That's a situation where to them that know to do good and do with it not, to them it is sin. He has special needs. He doesn't actually know. So what happens? In the time of this ignorance, the Most High winked at. So, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. He's so nonverbal. Right. That's kind of what I was picking up on. Okay. So he's not fully comprehending the commandment that she's giving that he can't do this thing, which is causing him to break the commandment. She needs to repent for him, right? Or teach him. He's nonverbal. So you may need to teach him what repentance means. If he doesn't understand it, he's your responsibility. You repent for him. Does that make sense? Okay. And he, he might go and fire up the microwave. Okay, but he doesn't know any better. Got it? Repent for him. And then, if it's possible, take Pastor Greg's uh, advice and unplug the microwave. Or hit the breaker. It may, may cause him to have a, a, an episode, though. Yeah. It may, it may make this whole situation worse. Yeah. The Most High is winking at him as he's using that microwave because the Most High knows his heart. Does that make sense? We don't know his heart. And that's what I was going to say is it's more, it's going to be more for you um, uh, more work, I guess. Um, so when you punish your child, 
it's also punishment for you yes. because you have to endure with him whatever all of that is and this is um, like a teaching thing so it's going to be a, a learning experience for you as well amen just real quick there's a question i think just got asked about eating chicken <laughs> are we not allowed to eat chicken is what it says um so do not believe what people say on the internet I know that's a misnomer because you're watching me on the internet, internet, and I'm telling you not to believe what people say on the internet. But what I'm saying is coming from the scriptures. Do not believe what people say on the internet. Believe what is written in the scriptures. Because Israel is going crazy. The more we wake up, the more we try to put our mark on the truth. Oh, well, I came up with this doctrine and I, I revealed that. Look, you guys, when you come in here, I'm not revealing nothing to you that you cannot figure out with the Holy Spirit by yourself by reading the scriptures. Hallelujah. If somebody thinks, oh, well, we can't eat chicken, prove it. That's all you got to say. You think you can't eat chicken? Prove it. Find it in the scriptures and show me. That's what we believe in, right? Because. <laughs> No, no, we, we, don't have, we don't have time. We don't have time. We don't have time. What go? Uh, basically, like, uh, when you get on social media, there's so much stuff that they expose, and they may change your whole mentality. Yeah. Like, I don't even want to say what I saw yesterday on Instagram about you. So, like, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Satan, is the, Satan is the prince of the power of the air, and all of this information is traveling through air waves, right? Stick to what? Stick to the script. Jurors. All right. Are we, uh, any last minute questions, comments, or go? Yes. On the Valley of the Blessings, that becomes the Valley of Choice. That's only for the people that are alive when Yahweh Shai returns, right? Because the people that have died have already made. No. Watch this. See, if, if it's going to be long, we can do it. It later. is going to be a little. No, let's okay. just do it later. Okay. Let's, let's get back to that. So at, at some point, we will need to discuss the Valley of Jehoshaphat and how it becomes the Valley of Decision. I'll remind you. Okay, amen. All right. Thank you, everybody, for being here. What a blessing it is that to have you all in person, everybody that's watching online. Thank you for your questions, comments, and concerns. Um, there has been like almost 60 people watching us for two hours in our Bible study, so that's awesome. And you guys, it's not as easy. Like, we're, we're spoiled because we're right here in the room. They're online dealing with the popping and the crackling and whatever's happening in their home happening at the same time. So we appreciate you guys riding with us. Uh, I just wanted to say, you're going to pray us out real quick, right? I just wanted yeah. to say, um, so uh, yesterday I went, or last night I went and I watched the service because we ended with prayer. And there was a gang of people in there asking for prayer as well at the end of uh, the new moon service. I just wanted to let you know, I did pray for you guys. Mm. We did see that and we prayed. I'm pretty sure there's other people who did that too. Um, so we are watching that. You guys are con in our family. I do consider you guys family. Mm. So we did pray for you. Go ahead, brother. Amen. Father, thank you for, Father, thank you for revealing your word to us. Um, we come here, the people online come here because we want to know the truth. We want to uh, go through all your scriptures to uh, try and understand and just to learn because we want to be good followers of, of you. We love you very much. Please bless everyone that um, that was in the study. Uh, we pray all these things in your son, Yahweh Shai's name. Amen. Amen.